In the middle of the kinder kindergarten classroom, there was a long table. At the end of the table was the birthday girl, Susie. In front of her, there were a huge pile of gifts, and her classmates sat around the table admiring her presents, as they also saw their little party bags. One of the boys was not pleased. He started, oh. Johnny looked at his little bag with two chocolates and a lollipop and a plastic whistle. He compared it to Susie's big pile of gifts, and he got angrier and angrier. The oofs grew louder and louder. Finally, one of the moms came over to little Johnny and knelt down, looked him in the eye, and said, Johnny, it's not your party. Paul Tripp shares this story and comments, the problem with Johnny is that he made the party all about himself. The party was planned for Susie. Invites were made, people came, gifts were bought and prepared. That was the plan. Johnny was invited. Johnny was included. But the plan was not mainly about him. Well, God has a plan, and it's easy for us to be like Johnny. Maybe we don't know the plan, or if we know the plan, we lose sight of the plan. We can easily start to think that our lives are mainly about us, and when things don't go our way, we grumble, we complain. We can be self-consumed and easily sidetracked. Scripture says we're like sheep gone astray. Each of us turn our own way. And in seasons like these that are so frequent, God and his kindness will help to reorient us. We were singing of his love. He goes out after the lost sheep to redirect us, to reorient us, to get us back on route to renew us. And that's exactly what Acts 5 can do for you if your heart is open to hearing and receiving the seeds of truth that are scattered on hearts this morning. Because there is one key truth that I pray will take root in your heart. It's a truth that is focused on the two verses in this Section verses 38 and 39. You see, there's conflict in Jerusalem. The conflict is escalating. The apostles are arrested. They are imprisoned. Of course, there's this great miraculous break from the prison. The apostles will not stop preaching. The rulers are enraged. They want to kill them. But a well-respected Jewish teacher warns them not to do it. In verse 38, Gamaliel says this, if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Well, we, the readers, know what Gamaliel doesn't. That God does have a plan, that Jesus has risen from the dead, that he is alive and well in heaven, and he is at work. Luke wants his readers to be certain of this truth. Here's the truth, the seed of truth. Oh, may it go in our hearts. This is the truth, that God's plan will prevail. May God drive that deep into our hearts as we study this orderly account. This sermon has two parts. The first part is much longer than the second. Not like a soccer game in Euro Cup. I'm watching, cheering for those English. I don't know who you're cheering for, but I tell you what, those soccer clubs, those coaches have plans. They're longing for their players to execute those plans. We'll see who wins. In this story, God has a plan and he will win. His plan will prevail. And for some reason, Luke wants to emphasize it for his readers as he seeks to instruct and disciple his readers through a narrative. So this is the first part. 
be certain that God's plan will prevail. This section has three questions. Three questions will guide us through this first part. Question number one, what is the plan? <laughs> well, you don't want to be certain of something you're not sure of. What is the plan? Well, for those of you who are new here, many of you new here, the book of Acts is actually the sequel to the gospel of Luke. There are two books, the end of the gospel of Luke and the beginning of Acts overlap like, like, uh, like hinges that keep two doors together. So it's important to study the ending of Luke and the beginning of Acts to understand the larger story of what Luke writes. Please, if you have your Bible or on your phone or a normal Bible, please look at Luke chapter 24. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's eating fish with his apostles. They're doing a Bible study and Jesus tells them three things must be fulfilled. He opens their minds to understand the scriptures, and in verse 46, he says this to them. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead. That was the plan. That he would suffer, firstly, and rise, secondly. But there's a third part of the plan, verse 47 and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So let's get this very clear and straight. I don't know how many of you are chefs or cooks. My wife loves to cook, and there's usually a plan for the meals she makes. There's steps, there's ingredients. I need that sort of thing when I'm in the kitchen, okay? So here it is, three things. According to Jesus, the risen Lord, he says it was God's plan first that Jesus should suffer. Number two, that Jesus should rise from the dead. And number three, that the gospel of the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed to all nations. That's a three-part plan. And in Luke's first book, how many parts of that plan were accomplished? Well, if you've read Luke, did Jesus die in that first book? Yes, he suffered on the cross according to God's plan. God predestined the death of his son. Secondly, did Jesus rise from the dead on the third day in the first book? Yes, yes he rose from the dead. There's a comical story of people who didn't recognize him, and he's walking with them along the way saying, what's wrong with you? Didn't you understand that I had, that the Christ had to die before entering his glory <laughs> and he's teaching the bible but the third part the gospel going to all nations is that fulfilled in the first book no that's what the whole second book is about how jesus is going to fulfill the third part of the plan but from heaven before he returns for the redeemed who he saves now I'm already kind of entering into the second question. So the, the first part of the question is, what is the plan? That is the plan. Jesus saves sinners through his death and resurrection, and then through the spirit-empowered preaching of his people to the ends of the earth before he returns. You can have all kinds of plans for your life, but this is the plan of plans. So secondly, how will Jesus fulfill the plan? Acts verse 1, or sorry, Acts chapter 1 verse 6, the apostles are asking Jesus, when will you fulfill the kingdom? When will you restore the kingdom? And he responds not by giving them a, a when answer, but a how answer. He says in verse 8, you, he says to the apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Remember they said, when will you, Jesus, restore the kingdom? He says, you <laughs> will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem first, and in Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So how will Jesus fulfill the plan? Jesus fulfills God's plan through the word of God that goes out through spirit-empowered witness to the ends of the world. 
And then look closely at verse 8, if you will, because this verse is so often mishandled, even among well-meaning evangelical Christians. There are no imperatives in this verse. If you want to preach the Great Commission as an imperative, go to Matthew's gospel. It preaches really well because Matthew shows us that Jesus does command. But this is not a command. In Luke's book, this is a promise. This is a prediction because Luke is focusing on what Jesus will certainly do. And no one, nothing's going to stop. He just predicts it. You will be my witnesses. And Jesus will surely make it happen. By the time we get to Acts 5, you and I know that nothing will stop the Lord Jesus. You can kill him, he will rise. Go to heaven, send the Spirit. You can arrest the apostles, you can warn the apostles, you can beat the apostles. Acts 7, you can kill Stephen and you will only advance the plan. You can't stop Jesus from fulfilling God's plan. He always does the will of the Father. Gamaliel doesn't even know Jesus is alive. Oh, the irony. Luke, what an author. Of course, it is God's word, the Spirit writing through Luke. But what an irony. He speaks far better than he knows. But you and I, the readers, we know by the time we get to chapter 5, yeah, that's the punch the culmination of this incredible story with the prison break and the apostles who refuse to stop speaking is that Jesus is at work fulfilling God's plan and nothing will stop him. That's the plan. That's how it prevails. But the question we also should be asking is why? This is the third question in part one. Why does Luke record this speech here? I mean, Peter gets to preach in chapter, Peter speaks in chapter one. Peter speaks in chapter two. Peter speaks in chapter three. Peter speaks in chapter four. What about John? Is God impartial? Can we hear any sermons from John or maybe Matthew? What about James? What about Thomas, the doubter? Like he was preaching. Can we, Luke, give us some of those sermons? No. In fact, the next speech is actually from an unbeliever. He's not even a Christian. This is the first speech of an unbeliever in the book of Acts. Astounding. And the truth is, he's not even right with much of what he says. I mean, you think of it. Is it true that if a religious movement is built on falsehood, it will perish fairly quickly? Lots of false religions have been persisting for a long time that are built on falsehood. But there's something in Gamaliel's words that function well in Luke's narrative and that are true. This what they're witnessing, the relentless preaching of the apostles who are preaching Christ, this movement in front of their face, he's right. If it is of God, you will not be able to stop it. And Luke wants his readers thinking about that and how that will apply to their lives. You know, Gamaliel's not saying, let's see if this is true. Let's see if Jesus rose from the dead. Let's, let's, let's study these things. No. His approach, is, his approach is fatalism. Luke could have easily uh, not included this speech. He knows how to summarize. He could have written, the leaders were enraged and wanted to kill the apostles, but after de- deliberation, they made the decision just to beat them, and they warned them to stop speaking. But no, Luke who is selective in what he writes in this orderly account, records these words from Gamaliel. Verse 38, keep away from these men. Let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. And isn't it fascinating that the signs of opposing God's plan in the narrative are things like jealousy and anger? That should sober us. 
because maybe we're opposed to God's will and his plan more than we realize. I know there's a holy jealousy in the Bible. I know there's a holy anger in the Bible. But I also know that Jesus said that sin is produced in our hearts. That's why he came. And it's not weird or abnormal to assume that sometimes we ourselves have lost sight of God's plan and we're like Johnny and we're just upset because things aren't going our way. We might be more like the religious leaders and we would be afraid to admit sometimes. I preach to myself. And I say that seeing all kinds of good fruit in the church. My wife and I are moving soon. Just yesterday, a whole bunch of you were like at my house serving me and my wife and my family. <laughs> so I, I, if you're visiting, I didn't like, you know, think, what does the church need to hear today? No, we're just going through Acts. And I see all kinds of good fruit in the church, but I'm just preaching the passage that comes next in the Bible, okay? And I do think it's good for all of us to hear this instruction. So we've looked at three questions. What is God's plan? How does it prevail? Why is Luke recording this stuff here? I mean, the last time he wrote a story like this in chapter 4, there was lots of conflict between the rulers and the apostles, and the whole thing led to a prayer meeting. I mean, I'm sure this time the believers are praying again, but Luke doesn't have a prayer meeting. There's conflict, there's arrest, there's don't speak, don't speak, and there's the apostles speaking and speaking. It's like the same thing again. But this time the whole thing culminates with a speech from an unbeliever. Fascinating narrative. In fact, one of the reasons why Luke records it is to help us understand the larger argument of everything he's writing. He writes these words from Gamaliel to help us to understand the larger argument of his narrative. As I mentioned earlier, <laughs> these words are to help you to see, yeah, you look, and it works both ways. You look back and it helps us to uh, make sense of what's happened in the story, and when you look forward from Acts 5, it helps you to see that this thing will go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It functions, the camera moves in both directions, and nothing will stop Jesus. Um, you know, in Google Maps, you can zoom in. We've zoomed into those two verses. You can zoom out. For just for a moment, I want to zoom out so that you can see and appreciate the significance of these verses in light of the book of Acts at large. For those of you familiar with Acts, you know Acts 1-8, right? Acts 1-8, you will be my Yes, you know that verse in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know it. But do you know Acts 8 1? 1 8? 8 1. 8 1's not as popular, but let's, let, let's look at this one. Acts 8 1. There arose on that day, the day they killed Stephen. Stephen was stoned to death. That's where the escalation, the conflict moves to. They kill Stephen, and Luke writes, that day, a great persecution it arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. I want to make sure you guys are with me this morning. Where were the Christians scattered? Throughout Judea and Samaria. What was Jesus' plan in Acts 1.8? God's people would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Luke is showing us, no matter what the opposition, nothing will stop Jesus. You can arrest them, you can beat them, you can warn them, you can kill them, but Jesus will just execute the plan of God. And the gospel goes into Samaria and Judea. Many people are getting saved. And if you know the story, the first story of a Gentile believer and his household who gets saved, the man's name is Cornelius. He's an Italian man. And the Jews aren't sure what to do with this. Like a, a Gentile is now one of us. You know, what does he, will he eat the way we eat? <laughs> 
How does he think of the Mosaic law the same way we do? And how should we think of the law? They have all kinds of questions now that Jesus is bringing in a new covenant, all kinds of stuff. So Peter has to explain what happened when the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and all those in his house. And Peter says this, Acts eleven seventeen, Who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? You're just like, I can't stop God. <laughs> you might not like what's happening. And that I went into the home of all these Gentiles, but Jesus did it. <laughs> Jesus is fulfilling God's plan. Nothing can stop him. So Gamaliel's advice in his words, if we want to handle the Bible properly, do you see that Luke is using these words to help us make sense of the larger argument because Luke is seeking to strengthen his readers with certainty. Who knows Theophilus' story? People were getting their homes stolen at this time in history. Christians were persecuted severely. Is it really worth suffering for the gospel? You better be sure this is true and that Jesus is alive and he is coming back. And he will get the inheritance of the nations for which he died. The outcome is secure. But are you sure? If you're not, you won't be like the apostles. Fully devoted to Jesus. And having your life completely centered on him, even if it means suffering, rejoicing that you're just counted worthy to be included and invited at the party. The, this is what Luke's getting at. Now, I said the second part of this would be shorter than the first, and it will be. But all I've done so far is to try to help you to see the way Luke is using these words in his narrative. These words from Gamaliel. He's teaching the truth that he wants you to be certain that God's plan will prevail. That's the truth. I can't make you receive it. Jesus taught that the hearts, there's like path and, and the seed bounces off the heart. I know the seed will bounce, but I long for there to be hearts, the good soil where the truth goes in. And if the truth goes in deep, what kind of fruit will come? That's part two. Well, what kind of good fruit will be produced in your life if you are readily aware of this, thinking about these things? No longer sidetrack this week. No longer taking a detour. You've been reoriented by scripture. Re renewed in your mind by Acts chapter 5. What good will that do other than saying that you know this is about God keeping his plans? Well, I think there's all kinds of good fruit that will be produced. But with the time we have, I just want to mention two things. Two things good fruits that will be produced from this seed of truth if you really are certain of this truth this week. Number one, you will have a sense of privilege that you get to participate in the plan. I mean, some of you might be thinking, well, if Jesus is going to do everything, I guess, like, let's go enjoy some vacation time. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's not the way the apostles thought. That's not the way you'll think if you really believe that you're the one who deserves humiliation and punishment and shame for your rebellion toward the creator of the world. Rejecting him in his plan and making your life about your family and your education and your future and your hobbies, and your kids, and their accomplishments. Things that are included in the plan, but not at the center. But what we do is we push those things, or we push those things from the side. We've been included, but like Johnny, we say, wait, wait. Let's, let, 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 let's bring this to the center. And, and it consumes our minds and our hearts. That if someone watched our lives closely and they heard our prayer life and they watched the way we spend our money and our time, they might start to think, oh, I get what Christianity is about. God's a genie. 
Jesus is a genie. He can help you get what you want, but in a kind of moral way. It's like a baptized self-centeredness. I, I get it. Yeah, and there's moralism. I want that. I want to become a Christian so that God will pl- bless me and my plans for my life. That is not Christianity. My friends, if you're here today, if you believe that, there is good news for you. That if you repent from that kind of thinking, oh, the blood of Jesus will wash you clean. Granted, you repent and turn to him and say, Jesus, would you be the center of my life? I confess my arrogance in making this about myself like Johnny. I want, oh, I'm just happy. I'm happy to be one day in your court, so God is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would happy to be a doorkeeper. I'll do anything. Let me just be a part of what you're doing. It's all about you. Jesus, my Savior, my King. Oh, yeah. That, and, 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 and you will receive the forgiveness of sins. Because that's God's plan to grant repentance and the forgiveness of sins to people who truly believe. That's good news for you. You can believe that. And if you've already believed that, oh, I hope this word is renewing you so you can get back to remembering what happened when you first believed. You confessed your sins. You were baptized. You said, I die. My old life is over. I rise to newness of life and pledge allegiance to King Jesus publicly. I devote my life to him and his kingdom and God's plan. And I am privileged to take part, even if that means packing up the McDonald's, packing up their dishes to help them get ready for a move. This is not just evangelism. Dorcas is highlighted later. That was her name, a lady named Dorcas. Funny name, I know. She made clothing for people. Barnabas sold a property and gave money to people who were in need. The the, the fruit of this kind of thinking is multifaceted with how you manage your finances, how you manage your time. All kinds of good fruit can be produced. But the one thing is certain, there's a sense of privilege that I get to be included, that I just get to participate in the plan. I am nothing. I deserve to be punished for my sins. Oh, thank you, God, that I get to be included. And when others are more prominent than I am, the Spirit can help us not to be jealous. When we are jealous, the Spirit can help us to fight that sin. And when we're enraged and upset that things are going our way, the Spirit can help us under the Lordship of Jesus to repent, find forgiveness, and to catch our stride, and to keep on that center road. But we must have this humble sense of privilege to participate. And last, the the second fruit that I want to mention, because we are in Acts 5, (laughs) is that you will have the fruit of resilience in your evangelism. Resilience in your evangelism. In the narrative We see in verse 13, the apostles were held in high esteem. And in verse 14, more than ever, uh, believers were being added to the Lord. And we see the religious leader, the high priest, was full of jealousy. Verse 17, he rose up, filled with jealousy. They arrest the apostles and put them in prison. They warn them not to speak, but... Dima read it. Thank you, Dima. You read the story earlier. There's this miraculous prison break, and the angel says, Go stand in the temple and preach. Don't listen to the high priest. (laughs) It's better to obey God rather than man. And they go and they preach. There's an irony because the the high priest doesn't realize it. They go and find that the jail is empty. And then someone comes and says, oh, they're in the temple preaching the very thing they were arrested for. So they go, but they fear the people. They're not full of courage, but they're full of fear. See the difference? They have another plan. Oh, they have another agenda. And it's largely about their own esteem and their prominence and their privileges, all baptized under the name of Yahweh and studying the Old Testament. It's sick, but we all know how to do it. That's what they're doing. But the report comes in in verse 25. Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So as I mentioned, they go, they get them. They won't do it with force, though, because it says in verse 26, they're afraid of being stoned by the people. In verse 27, the high priest says, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. 
Yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching. We, the readers, know that actually Jesus has done it through the Spirit and through them. <laughs> and the, he says, you intend it, you're making us guilty. He doesn't stop to want to study the gospel. He's just concerned about himself. You're making, you're, all of this, everything you're saying, it, 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 you're making us sound like we're guilty. Well, they were guilty. They, they plotted the crucifixion of an innocent Messiah, which was according to God's plan, but they were fully responsible for their sin. And Peter says to him, we must obey God rather than men. And Peter goes on to preach Christ and this, these words of life. But what a good word, what, what, what an amazing text here. Gamaliel will speak, will step up and speak. We've already looked at that this morning. So they decide not to kill them, just to beat them. And then look at verse 41. Luke writes, the apostles left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They are so thankful that they could be included and get to participate and even to experience something of the humiliation and suffering and shame of their exalted Lord. They would consider it an honor that they, on their road, would get to experience suffering in his name, this road that will be a journey to glory, and they long for his return, but that they would get to participate in suffering. They're so impacted by the gospel of their Lord who died upon a shameful tree that they rejoice that they could, be, they could suffer in this way. And then verse 42, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. They did not cease to teach or preach that the Christ is is Jesus. Do you hear the resilience, the God-given resilience in the men? Who believe that Jesus will fulfill God's plan. That truth is deep in their hearts. So they will not stop speaking about Jesus. They get back up. Not because they're self-confident. Their confidence is in Jesus, the exalted Lord, and the empowerment of the God-given Spirit to help them in their weakness. This is the fruit of resilience that is found in the lives of Christians who firmly believe that God will, God's plan will prevail. So those are two fruits, this sense of privilege, this resilience in evangelism. Just there are, There's much more fruit on this tree. Those are two fruits from believing in this truth, that God's plan will prevail. I don't know what your week looks like and what your circumstances are. For Johnny, he was at a birthday party. He saw a big pile of gifts. There's something that made him angry, though. He lost sight of the plan. He wanted to be at the center, but that was not the plan. May God help us this week. May God help you, whoever you are, whatever your circumstances, to remember that as important as they are, and they are part of the plan, and God does care about them, and the numbers of the hair of your head, I don't have your hairs, they're numbered. God is intimate. He loves you. Think of Luke's first book. The father, when the prodigal son comes back, he kills the fattened calf, he throws a party, he embraces him, he kisses him. Think of the story in the first book with Zacchaeus. Jesus came 
to seek and to save the lost. Jesus loves sinners. The Father loves his people. But he doesn't love our foolish ways. So if he's got his finger by the Spirit, as I've been preaching on something in your life that you've brought to the center, pray about these things. Cast your cares upon the Lord. Keep them under his lordship. But may God help you to remember this week, these things ought not to be at the center. Jesus is at the center. And the spreading of the gospel and the spiritual growth of his people. May God help us. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us today. Help me, help all of us to be certain that your plan will prevail. That Jesus will do it. Oh, give us a sense of privilege that we get to participate. Help us not to be like Johnny. Help us to keep your plan and your mission and Jesus and his people at the center. May your word be a lamp for our feet this week. May your word by the Spirit light a fire in our hearts that with your help will not go out for a very long time. In Jesus' name, amen.